Hey guys, welcome to uh, Dr. G Learning Series here. Uh, today we're going to talk about food as medicine. So because of the whole COVID thing, we're uh, doing some of these um, online and through the Dr. G Show, as opposed to doing them live at the health food store, OptiLife, or other places. So um, glad you guys are joining me here. So we're talking about food as medicine, really how to eat your way out of virtually every disease. Uh, this was one of my probably first topics I've ever did. Uh, it's also one of my favorite ones. So as we get started, uh, for those that don't know who I am, I'm Dr. Garrett. Um, I uh, have a doctorate in chiropractic uh, medicine. I also went to medical school for about three and a half years. Um, quit to practice functional lifestyle medicine because I was very frustrated with what we were doing. Um, I've been doing this for nearly 20 years, 17 years, getting close. Uh, and I specialize in reversing acute and chronic conditions naturally. So uh, as we go through this, you'll realize we kind of kind of cause almost all our chronic problems. So I have patients that come from here and all around the world, and we teach them how to reverse uh, things that everybody says is not reversible, mainly by looking at what they eat, drink, breathe, rub on skin, and how they stress. So if it's chronic, it's something we're chronically doing. Food as medicine is a huge part of that, right? I mean, your body, oh, all right, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Sorry, getting all excited. Um, so anyways, uh, international speaker, um, also a postgraduate educator, national speaker all across the country. And then I was uh, lucky enough to be one of the keynote speakers at the International Symposium uh, on Health and Wellness in Thailand last year. And that was pretty uh pretty uh, awesome honor and uh, that was a fabulous experience with uh, kind of experiencing what they do with Thai wellness which is a very uh, synergistic thing which with uh, what we do with functional lifestyle medicine here and then postdoctoral education so this is continuing education that I've done that changed how I practice and the biggest uh, uh, influence on me was Harvard Life School Harvard Medical School's lifestyle medicine program where they basically said, patient has this condi condition, what are they doing to cause it? Teach them to stop causing it. So that's really the kind of foundation of what I do. And then Yale had a pretty good one uh, for lifestyle medicine program. And then uh, also did biomedical engineering open course through Yale University. Also epigenetics, which I love epigenetics. Uh, I've done that through um, University of Melbourne. It was an open course. And then same thing with John Hopkins for the dermatology review every year. I have lots of uh, diplomates and certifications from different boards, everything from um, internal uh, medicine to functional medicine to clinical nutrition um, and so on. And then I'm a senior fellow for the American Academy of Functional Medicine, so when other doctors can't figure out how to fix someone, help them fix themselves, um, that's where we come in from the senior fellows standpoint. Lots of clinical clerkships, I got the opportunity to be first assistant on lots of surgeries. That's the only time I felt like we really fixed much of anything, but uh, got lots and lots of other experiences. Uh, so I maybe around 4,000 hours of clinical rounds. And then I'm a, lead, a member of a lot of uh, organizations, serve on lots of boards, and I think uh, there's a couple missing on there, but uh, we'll get that updated. And then I also do research through a grant-funded grant funded, uh uh, research program at KU Medical School in Progenomics, and that's pretty awesome. And then I had the uh, TV show for a couple years where I uh, taught uh, kind of food as medicine. So, you know, we went through and actually, um, um, I, you know, as I'd cook, I'd tell, them, you know, tell everybody about what's in all these ingredients and what they actually do for our physical health and mental health. So that was really exciting. Also had the Cooking After Dark with Dr. G show, um, and that was a limited time, a limited one uh, that's on YouTube. And then I also had to do a weekly show called the Dr. G show, and we have a channel on YouTube for that, which is where this is. So uh, feel free to look at uh, other ones. I also have lots of other ones that are on my actual YouTube channel too, but. All right, so eating your way out of disease. So um, the idea that you can eat your way out of almost every disease, it, it comes from the research that shows that 92% of all heart disease and stroke, uh, which is the number one killer and um, I think number six or something like that, 
or actually it was number one until last year. And then we can prevent 80% of almost all disease, and then 60 to 80% of all cancers, and that's from the American Cancer Association, but you can prevent 100% of all type 2 diabetes cases, which if you uh, watch the diabetes, reversing diabetes um, talk that we did the other day, same concept of like uh, we didn't have it and we caused it, now there's type 3 diabetes, soon there'll be type 4 diabetes. So, But when you look at this, I mean literally, the thing that plagues most people, you know, three out of four have chronic diseases that they're chronically managing. They're spending an absurd amount of money to manage these conditions. When research shows and clinical practice shows, I mean, most all the diseases are preventable, you know? So that's a hell of a lot of savings. And we talked about this when we talk about type 2 diabetes and reversing it, but disease really isn't disease in the way that you think about it. Really, disease is an absolute, uh, sorry, absolutely normal expectation for an abnormal lifestyle. You can only disrupt normal physiology for, very, uh, for a certain amount of time before you have consequences to that. And as we go through this process, it's less of like, why do people have these conditions? And more like, yeah, uh, that makes sense, right? Of course. So if you think about disease very differently here, right? There's what's called homeostasis and there's allostasis, right? Homeostasis is the ability to kind of maintain internal, external environments so you're kind of in harmony, right? Uh, if you think about like this picture here, the guy's out in the desert, uh, body heats up, your body responds by sweating. That cools down the body. And as long as you keep consuming water, you keep sweating out water and you maintain a constant homeostasis uh, within your body when people can survive in the desert, right? But what if they don't drink water? That one simple thing, don't drink water, but yet your body still has to try to sweat and overcome. And eventually they will end up in heat stroke, they'll have uh, delusions and uh, coma and then they'll eventually die. They will die from something that the solution was water. Like, that's the craziest thing, right? So it's not heat stroke as a disease. It's not dehydration as a disease. It is, yeah, if you don't drink water, you can't maintain normal homeostasis, so drink some damn water, right? So when we start to look at that same concept and we say, hey, I eat a bunch of chemicals made from petroleum, but I don't feel good, right? My gum is preserved with paint thinner. Why don't I feel good? You shouldn't. You shouldn't. Right. So as we go into this, I want to talk to you about like just example of gum. Like I said, right. The colors are made from coal tar. The flavors made from coal tar. The preservatives are paint uh, paint thinner, which is um, uh, butyl hydrotoluene, and the three sugars in there, the fake sugars, are all made from formaldehyde, which is all petroleum products. So you eat a product that's constantly uh, produced, or sorry, that's made from all these different petroleum products, and there's a consequence to pay for that. So how long can you do that before you end up with cancer or some weird autoimmune disease? Well, that's what we're doing. This gigantic 330 million uh, person experiment uh, since 1960, and really since about 1900. So now, take that concept and say, what changed in 2006 in America? And this is pretty crazy because I grew up in, as a Gen Xer, like, I mean, you know, we were like, oh, to always taught smoking's bad, smoking's bad, smoking's bad, right? That's going to kill everybody. It's going to destroy your life. But in 2006, we found that the American diet was the leading cause of preventable death over smoking. It is now better for this kid on the right to eat a bunch of fast food at McDonald's than to smoke, or sorry, 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 sorry. It is now better for this kid on the right side to smoke cigarettes instead of eating all that fast food. That's where we are, right? We, we already have said that, you know, uh, the American processed meat, the World Health Organization says, it's more likely to cause cancer than smoking cigarettes. Just our processed meat, because we use cancer-causing chemicals to preserve it, right? We use arginine, cancer-causing arginine, or no, no, sorry, no, arginine, arsenic, cancer-causing arsenic to make chickens fatter. Well, that's great. So then we take arsenic chickens and we put cancer-causing nitrates, and then, yeah, your freaking deli meat should cause you to have cancer. Like, it's not a why. It's a 
Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. That's of course, right? So we, when we look at allostasis at its best, in 2006, we literally have food now that's worse than smoking cigarettes. And here's a, a little thing on the left side. Uh, you know, the average American eats about 2,000 pounds of food a year now, right? Uh, that's the same as a Volkswagen. So we're eating a Volkswagen's worth of food every single year. And for most people, that's 75% too much food. So even if you look at that chart on the left side, right, we have fruits and vegetables, but it's not bell peppers people are eating. It's uh, mostly potatoes in the form of french fries and potato chips. And then when we look at fruit, it's not fruit really that people are eating in mass. It's mostly juice. And juice without fiber ends up becoming sugar. Juice should be the worst thing you do in the best diet, not the best thing you do in the worst diet, if that makes any sense. So, if you look at corn is sugar, sugar is sugar, flour is sugar, dairy is sugar, juice is sugar, over half the American diet is just different forms of sugar. And then we also look at dairy and dairy and dairy and dairy, and almost half the diet's dairy also. So this is the diet that makes people sick, fat, and dumb. In fact, if you look at fish, fish uh, is one of the most anti-inflammatory foods that we could eat. It's uh, eating one serving of cold water fatty fish is uh, the same anti-inflammatory properties as one full strength ibuprofen without killing your kidney and liver in the process. But we consume more coffee by pound than we do fish. So none of this. Fruits and vegetables reverse almost all disease. And then we have fish as the most anti-inflammatory disease reversing food. And it's the least stuff that we're going to consume in the American diet. So compare that to what the rest of the world eats. So if we look at other countries, if we look at like the book like the Blue Zones, right? And we say, well, what are the healthiest, happiest, longest living populations do? What do they do differently that we could do? As Americans, we're very like anti like... Well, if every other country's got it figured out, well, they're just dumb and they don't know what the hell's going on. Only America knows how to solve American problems. That's ridiculous, right? So, we want to say what do the healthiest, most successful countries consistently do that we could just do? So, Blue Zones is a wonderful place to start. So, there's a book written by Dan Butner, and that kind of goes through several different countries that uh, you can say, well, okay, I can adopt some of these things. And so there's things that they do very differently, but there's common things among them. And then there's the most common nine things that they all do together. And then when you look at those nine things, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, of course they should have all be healthier, happier, and live longer, right? Of course, right? So um, when you think about food, th this would be my food pyramid. If you wanted to create a food pyramid that had nothing to do with money or politics, this is what it looks like, right? So you are 100% food. Every single hormone, every single neurotransmitter, every single cell, of those 100 trillion cells in your body, all came from something you've eaten in the last 10 years. There is no tissue in your body, no cell greater than 10 years old, from your brain to your nerves to your, your fingernails. There's nothing older than 10 years of age in your body. So most of it's turned over quicker, but it's all based on what you put in to build that tissue. Even a mom that just had a baby, 100% of that baby was what mom ate in the last nine months. We start out as a food baby, and then we just eat our way through all our biochemistry. So we're either eating to support our physiology and biochemistry, or we're not. And once you stop doing it, things don't work. Things fall apart. And that's exactly what should happen. It's not a disease, it's what should happen. If you look at the biggest, strongest animals on earth, they eat almost all greens. That's it. Do you want to be strong as a rhinoceros? 2,500 pound beast that can flip over cars like nothing. 2,500 pounds of muscle and bone eat salad all day. You can be strong as a Clydesdale horse, right? Pulls the Budweiser uh, wagon. That beast is a vegetarian eating salad all day, right? You want to be strong as an elephant, strong as uh, you know, a, a, a brontosaurus. They're all vegetarians. They just eat salad. So we don't think of the food the same way anymore, right? We, we, we think of like, well, where does protein come from? The protein that you eat that you think is meat 
came from plants. The biggest, strongest animals are on earth just eat plants. So you can just eat plants and get every single nutrient you need and, of course, all the protein you need. Just like every other gigantic, dumbass animal in nature that doesn't even know what protein is. That's how simple this is. But then people go, well, I'm not a cow. Great. You're 3% genetically different from a gorilla. From person to person, between me and you, we're only 1% genetically different. For a gorilla, we're about 3% genetically different. So a gorilla's diet, who's six times stronger than a human, is half fruit, half uh, uh, greens. So they just eat fruits and vegetables and greens. That makes the biggest, strongest animals still. So then people go, well, we should be vegetarian. You can be, but you don't have to be. So if we look at like meat, then we just say, well, we want to eat a little bit of meat. The world's healthiest, happiest, long living populations eat very little meat, but their meat eats this stuff, not a bunch of subsidized inflammatory corn. So just like we'll talk about later, if the cow eats inflammation and you eat the cow, you get the cow's inflammation, and then you should have inflammatory problems. If you sprout stuff, so you know sprouted mung beans and alfalfa sprouts, you should get 300% more nutrition. Amazing. Nuts and seeds, cold-pressed oils, uh, seaweed, herbs. I mean, again, you put it all together, that's a meal. But the reality is a meal is whatever you want it to be. So there's only two food rules as we go through this. Eat real, actual food. Only eat to get rid of hunger. There is no animal out there that has to figure out what to eat, what time of day to eat, how much to eat, none of that stuff. There's no, there's no animal trying to figure out what's breakfast, lunch, and dinner food. These are all made up concepts. And so I have hundreds of books here in the home that tell you how to eat, and they all disagree with each other. And that's why. If you read all of them, you can't eat anything. But if you look at what I do, you can eat everything as long as it's real food. And you'll be fine. So, two food rules. Eat real food, only eat to get rid of hunger. If you eat to get full, you're eating for about 45 minutes longer. You're typically eating about 75% more food. And then you have to go pay a gym to work that stuff off. So, only two food rules. So your biochemistry that needs to eat biochemistry to support your biochemistry. So, as we go through this, we want to talk about how to eat way out of heart disease in, how to balance cholesterol. Um... If you haven't seen the cholesterol myth is killing you and your family, uh, look at that one. I, I did that one a couple weeks ago and put on YouTube. And then eating your way out of cancer and eating your way out of diabetes, which again, that's a whole separate one that's more intense uh, that you can look at. Even the eating at your way to heart disease. All, all these are separate ones too. So look at heart disease. This is pretty much every map of uh, disease in America, right? So it was very low. We change something, create a sudden epidemic, and we maintain that epidemic because it's profitable. We say this in other uh, um, uh, other YouTube uh, videos that we've done, where if you look at that sudden decrease here, well, it doesn't keep going down like that. But this is just where we've started sowing uh, veins from your leg onto your heart. So cabbages or uh, coronary artery bypass grafts, we got really good at that. So we were able to cut down heart disease or delay heart disease uh, for quite a bit just by doing that, which is not a solution, right? So every disease chart looks like that, except for autism and chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Otherwise, they all look like this. Normal, epidemic, maintain it, America. So if we look at that heart disease, right? Let's go back to this. There's our heart disease. But Prevention Magazine published a study from Boston Medical School, and it said that 92% of all heart disease could be reversed or prevented with five basic things. Just five. Again, we are not waiting on new technology to cure all our problems. We're not waiting on some miracle supplement or some magical barrier from the jungles that only I know about and I sell, right? We want common sense solutions that the world's healthiest populations use. So they said moderate alcohol, but again, for Americans, that's not beer, that's not Moscato, that is red wine. So about a glass a day is what you want. So Americans don't do that. Most countries do. 
uh, healthy diet. <laughs> We're not doing that. That's crazy talk. So fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, berries, whole grains, all that kind of stuff. That's not what we do at all, right? Fruits and vegetables, they say the average American now eats one fruit or vegetable a day. Uh, we usually eat processed grains, no fish, and not really much legumes. And then daily exercise. Now this is a little bit more, but the average American or average European walks about 10,000 steps a day. Uh, the average uh, American walks uh, 5,000 to 2,500, so half to a quarter of just walking, right? And then one strenuous a uh, activity a week for an hour. One a week. We're not doing that. So, healthy body weight, waist size, 85% uh, of your hip size. So, you can either just get bigger hips or... The two th or three things above are going to help fix that. And then, of course, not smoking. And so after a year or greater, I mean, that's a huge benefit. But it's just those five things. Just those five things can almost get, uh, vanquish one of the most common things that kills you and your family, uh, let alone having partial strokes for the rest of your life and dealing with that mess. But my goodness, like it's so simple. But we don't do that. It's not our nature. Harvard did this study where they looked at, you know, this ridiculous concept we have since the 1970s of saying fat causes heart disease, which it doesn't. Uh, the countries that eat the most fat have the most uh, most uh, uh, heart disease prevention. Uh, and they're the skinniest country, which is Japan. But this is the second heart attack. So once someone has like a TIA, they have like an 80% uh, risk of having a heart attack within the next... A uh, few weeks to, to definitely the next year, but um, they did this this little breakdown. So what about uh, cutting the fat down in your diet, which is one option, and then otherwise just increasing fat from fish and adding fruits and vegetables. Now other studies will look at show fruits and vegetables de uh, de plaque your arteries, fish de plaque your arteries. If you cook in turmeric and ginger, de plaque your arteries versus just like get rid of fat. Fat's killing everything. And of course, fish and veggies one. So um, the reason that is, is because fish, the one of the least eaten foods in America, and, and let alone wild caught. But wild caught, a high omega-3 fat, fatty fish, like salmon, tuna, halibut, mackerel, cod, sardines, low mercury, high omega-3, they have nine different ways by which they protect your heart. So they block platelet aggregation, which is platelets are like a broken plate, and those uh, end up getting caught in the spider web that becomes a clot. So it prevents clots, which means you can't have heart attacks or strokes that way. Reduces blood vessel constriction, so instead of having tight, uh, angry arteries, it actually allows them to be nice and big, so blood pressure then drops. Uh, increases blood flow because bigger pipes can flow more blood, so you get more oxygen, more nutrients, and things heal faster, and you feel healthier and happier. More energetic, and it lowers fibrinogen, so then there's less fibrinogen to block or to bind to the platelets to create clots, so less heart attack, less uh, stroke. And then increases fibrino, fibrino no, sorry, fibrinolytic activity, and fibrin is a type of uh, a protein that binds together, so that becomes scar tissue. So when we look at like um, prolytic therapy for like reversing scar tissue, like we had a patient with Dupuytren contracture where it's all uh, scarred up, boom, six months later, gone, right? So your body does this naturally just through fish. So it can break up the whole, uh, it actually breaks up clots. It's a clot busting mechanism, let alone scar tissue. Lowers triglycerides, which then is really the measure of sugar converting to fat. Uh, raises antioxidant rich HDL. So there's no medication that raises high density lipoproteins, which is always a great indicator of how well you're really doing in life because HDLs are healthy fats and movement. So you can't fake those. Increases cell membrane flexibility, so you know you have hardening of the arteries. Uh, this prevents hardening of the arteries, and then of course lowers blood pressure because of a combination of all these, uh, but especially number two. So, 
nine different ways. So think about this, like all the family members you have, all the people in your church, all the people in the community. And we have people having heart attacks in their 20s now. We have heart disease starting as young as 10 years of age now, right? It's insane. But it's all diet. It's all diet that's causing it. Heart disease is inflammation, not cholesterol. Inflammation. If you eat inflammation, you suffer from its effects. If the cow eats inflammation, you suffer from the cow's inflammation when it becomes your inflammation. Harvard did this other uh, cool study where they looked at heart prevention studies. So again, first heart attack, right? Uh, and they found that basically there was four, the four most potent foods against having heart disease was nuts, uh, garlic, alcohol, and onions. If you guys have ever cooked mirepoix style or French cooking, you you know always start off. This is very different from American, but this is how you should cook food. You always start off with warming oil, and then you put all your herbs and spices in the oil. That heats those up, that infuses that oil with those uh, uh, herb oils and, and uh, spice oils, as opposed to putting them on top of the food and it's not cool enough or it's not hot enough to actually extract out. So you get more uh, flavor in your food with mirepoix. But always start off with diced carrots, uh, celery, onion, and I say garlic. And if you do that every single time, no matter what you're making, you're making steak, you're making fish, you're making uh, soup, you always start off with mirepoix. And you're getting a ton of every single meal anti-inflammatory, anti-heart attack foods, right? And alcohol on here is not beer. It is not white wine. It is not Moscato. It is red wine. And then arrhythmias. You no, know, arrhythmias are irregular heartbeats. And... I have to say, in clinical practice, uh, even from the natural lifestyle medicine standpoint, we're damn near 100% in reversing people's arrhythmias. Uh, it's been some interesting causes over the years, right? Uh, a lot of it is pesticides, herbicides that are known to cause irregular heartbeats. Uh, your heart runs off omega-3s, not omega-6s, so if you put diesel fuel in your gas car, <laughs> it's not going to work very well either. So. Uh, Typically, if we remove the cause and feed what it needs, it goes away. Uh, but a lot of times people will get the pacemaker, they'll burn out the SA node of the heart, and then they'll just get a mechanical one, you know, because you, your diet messes up your body, so we say, well, kill that part of the body, and we'll just use electronics. But coffee tends to be a, a pretty um, strong indicator for arrhythmia, and now, of course, energy drinks too, which send about 22,000 young, 22, young Americans to the ER every year just for... Uh, irregular heart uh, beats and chest pain. So coffee and Red Bull, and that's because coffee, you know, green tea has uh, 25 milligrams of caffeine, white tea, yellow tea has 15 milligrams of caffeine. At that point, it's nootropic medicine, which actually makes you smarter, healthy, better memory, better energy. You don't spike up and crash like you do with like a lot of black tea. But um, black tea has 50 milligrams, Red Bull has 85, Monster has 160, coffee has 100 to 200 for a little cup of coffee. So most people's uh, vente mocha should cause panic attacks all day, but even irregular heartbeats all day. And then angina, uh, angina is just chest pain, so usually not getting enough oxygen, and it's usually things that are like beer and anger, which kind of go together if you live in the South. So, Removing alcohol to see, does that just automatically make it go away? But again, red wine should not be one of the ones that cause the angina. This is one of my favorite uh, collections of research because it's just like a meal, right? So uh, garlic was shown to be heat stable and it's a very potent uh, clot fighter. So bust up clots for heart attack and stroke. Uh, but Cornell University, who um, Andy... Uh, Andy who graduated from Cornell off the office, right? Uh, it showed that red wine's resveratrol uh, actually um, busts up clots. So red wine, for those of you that not, not uh, don't drink alcohol, well, then you just do red, purple, or black grapes. Zhejiang University uh, in China it seems kind of biased, but they did uh, green tea. Uh, and the tannins, or the catechins, uh, they actually blocked the the platelets from clumping together 
And they did it as strong as ASA or aspirin or ibuprofen does. So people that take that 81 milligrams or 325 milligrams a day, and instead of getting a bleeding disorder, which 70% get after two weeks of taking that, uh, according to research, or it becomes the leading cause of uh, uh, kidney failure in the United States, they can do that without causing those. A Swedish study uh, said that fruits and vegetables lower fibrinogen, which then again busts clots. So we said before fish does this. So you got fish, some green tea, some red wine, some garlic to cook it in, and some fruits and vegetables. Kind of sounds like a lifestyle, right? It's just diet. So constantly eating a diet that's reversing heart disease all day long. They did this really cool study uh, in um, Italy. And they did it for uh, 12 months on a high potassium diet. Now, most people, when they think potassium, they think uh, bananas. But actually, avocados are higher than bananas. A apricots are higher than bananas. So there's all kinds of different uh, potassium-rich foods. But really, it's just fruit, vegetable, nuts, seed, bare legumes, greens. But all they did with this study was they added one more potassium-rich food. So they said it's not salt. We think it's potassium deficiency. And at the end of the study, they found that 81% of those uh, that took the that, that were participating in the study could cut their meds in half. 81% from adding one food to their diet. Almost 40% were able to be completely med free by adding one food, not not another new medication, but adding food. And then every medication they don't take, then they don't have to worry about nutrient deficiencies and side effects from that. Now, again, cholesterol, that's always a great topic, but uh, check out the other YouTube uh, talk that we have on the Dr. G show for um, uh, why cholesterol, why the cholesterol myth is killing you and your family, and we'll go through that in way more detail than on this one. But really, we don't want to lower cholesterol. We want to balance cholesterol. We want to really just amp up healthy cholesterols, which again is only diet and movement. There is no pill for that. So when we look at triglycerides, that's diet. When we look at VLDLs, that's just diet. When we look at HDLs, that's just diet and movement. When we look at LDLs, that's still diet. So uh, cholesterol has never been shown to cause heart attacks or stroke. It's just because they find it in oxidized versions in plaque, but that's great. You can find spackle on damaged uh, sheetrock, but that's not, you don't blame the spackle, you, you, you blame the damage, right? So people have this highly inflammatory diet that's 40 times the inflammatory omega-6s uh, versus the one anti-inflammatory omega-3s, and then they end up with lots of damage, and then they go, oh, let's blame your body. But cholesterol is vitamin D, it's testosterone, it's progesterone, it's pregnenolone, it's anti-aging hormone, it's uh, estrogens, it's cortisol. You, it's 80% of your brain, 20% of your cell. You have to have lots of cholesterol so we don't lower it. But we want healthy, anti-inflammatory versions of all those. So foods that help uh, is basically, again, very basic diet. Fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, berry, legumes, and greens. The same thing is true with like raising HDLs, preventing oxidation. Uh, beans uh, worldwide has been shown to be the cheapest solution ever. Now they used to say back in the day uh, that was one of the advertisements for uh, oats, but probably oats are too inflammatory these days just because they're cross-reactive. I wouldn't do those. Stick with beans, like lots of different colored of beans, right? Super nutrient dense super nutrient dense and very very anti-inflammatory and healthy and lowers your blood sugar and, and 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 so on right just diet so balancing cholesterol lowering triglycerides which means lowering uh, extra sugar so the average american consumes 150 pounds of added sugar but in 50 different forms uh refined flours uh fruit juices dried fruits and excessive alcohol but again not red wine alcohol uh, but when, you know, when you look at like a carbohydrate, if you don't know this, but a carbohydrate is sugar bound to oxygen bound, sugar bound to oxygen bound, sugar bound to oxygen bound to sugar. So all bread is 100% sugar. But if you have fiber in fruits and vegetables and uh, breads, whole grains, that fiber absorbs 80% of that sugar and creates a product called fructo oligosaccharides, which is what we call prebiotics at the health food store. 
because it feeds your gut bacteria. So 80% of the sugars, if it's whole food, whole grain, is actually low glycemic. It does not mess up your blood sugar. Nobody's become diabetic because of bananas and cantaloupe and grapes. Okay? But that feeds your gut bacteria. That bacteria then, which is 750 to 1,000 different strains, according to Harvard, 10 times more human cells, 10 times more than your human cells in your body, they then become 75% of your immune system so you don't have to fight stuff like coronavirus. The other thing is it makes B vitamins, which then make you healthier and happier. It also makes butyrate, which feeds DNA polymerase, so it edits out mutations in your DNA so you have less cancer. So it's so simple, just that simple stuff, right? Uh, so we didn't really have uh, type 2 diabetes until we created these things that then jack up our triglycerides. So just a bunch of sugar. If we look at cancer, same kind of thing, right? Uh, this is um, last year cancer became the leading cause of uh, uh, death in the U.S. And when we look at the comparisons, uh, look at the top one, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Both of those are estrogenic, synthetic estrogens, colognes, perfumes, dairy, plastics, right? Then we have lung, which is uh, smoking, but also um, even medications like metformin causes small cell cancers now. But then colon, uh, so that goes back to diet. So the solution to that is like uh, fiber, <laughs> right? So when we look at these cancer rates and we say, well, wait a minute, it, the American Cancer, cancer Association says that almost all cancer is preventable or reversible. Well, what the hell are we doing, right? Why is more people dying now than ever from it? So if you look at the causes of this, diet is the leading cause. And then smoking, right? Diet and smoking gets rid of most all cancer. And then beer or sugar, which is alcohol, and then occupational, so being around things like benzene all day. There's a few viruses that cause cancer. So the HPV, right? Don't, ugh, never mind, we won't talk about that. Sunlight, which is a bunch of bull crap, it's more likely benzene, the same thing that causes occupational. If we then take that occupational benzene and we say, well, what if we put that benzene in uh, SPF products that uh, protect you from the sun, uh, won't they cause the same cancer? <laughs> right? right? That would make sense, but um, we blame the sun. So apparently the sun hates us. So, But look at that. These are all things. We put it on our skin, um, others, chemical. So diet, or diet and lifestyle, diet and lifestyle, diet and lifestyle, um, kind of lifestyle. This is probably diet and lifestyle and what you eat, drink, breathe, run on your skin. Viruses we can't do anything about, but what we eat can then um, get rid of those. And 85% of all, even HPV cancer viruses, auto resolve anyway. So that then goes back to the lifestyle. So that's why when they say diet and lifestyle can get rid of, you know, 80% of cancers, like, yeah, that's because we cause those, right? So the National Cancer Institute then has a. Uh, this research that came out and said the more fruits and vegetables people eat the less likely they are to get cancer from the colon stomach breast and lung so that's the top major cause of the cancer they also said this amazing thing that said eating uh now it used to be five servings of fruits and vegetables now it's 13 which again is still just about six pieces of fruits or vegetables or like two or three per meal still nothing if you eat a real diet but not only will it uh, prevent reverse the top three, but it will reverse up to 75% of cancer or uh, prevent 75% of cancer in smokers. In smokers. Just huge. So a lot of times when you go overseas and you're, just, you're like, what's these people in Okinawa and they're smoking cigarettes and cycling and stuff, and you're like, well, how come they don't have all this lung cancer? Because uh, they eat to prevent it, right? Like we said, that fruit and, and, and the fiber in your food literally makes butyrate, which is now become one of the most a new expensive chemotherapeutic, is something you naturally make to edit out mutations at the rate of 10,000 times per cell per day. So 100, million, or 100 trillion times 10,000 is how many times a day that your diet changes your DNA. 
if you eat fruits or vegetables. And we said the average American eats one fruit or vegetable a day. So they're going to put on lots of cancer-causing stuff, and they're going to prevent the body from reversing it. Another research article, they said, well, what are the most... Uh, uh, the fastest ways to encourage cancer, right? So the middle one here, uh, lots of inflammatory meat, high fat foods, not high healthy fat, high inflammatory fat, omega-6 fats, right? Vegetable oil, which is corn, which is inflammatory. Inflammation causes disease. And then excessive alcohol, but again, it's beers, which is sugar. So we take a bunch of inflammation and sugar, and yeah, that's what, you ha that's what happens, right? But what is the anti-cancer diet? Um... Fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, berries, legumes, and greens, right? Fish, green tea, stuff we don't eat as Americans, right? If you look at the anti-cancer spread, it's even the more nutrient-dense foods, right? Uh, with seafood, not like uh, shrimp, but like ocean-caught, wild-caught fish, right? But then we have our garlic, our cruciferous vegetables, which are called our brassicas. And brassicas are very, very anti-cancer because they actually work at an epigenetic level. But we're not eating that stuff. So you can see, just like we did with heart disease, it's just diet. When we get to cancer, yeah, you can eat to cause it or you can eat to, to uncause it. So what are we going to do? Well, as Americans, we're going to eat a bunch of Cheetos and then we're going to go to church and try to pray away our cancer. with some bull crap. We can't do that. Other recommendations here, basically, again, it's fruits, vegetables, nuts, seed, berry, legumes, greens. No surprise. And that licorice is licorice root, not licorice candy. But it should be no surprise as we go through this. This is what I love about what I do for my job, right? This is why I have, like, crazy high job satisfaction because I take people at their absolute worst and just teach them how to stop causing all their problems. And it's amazing how fast people reverse. And they were told by all these other doctors, they'll never get better, never get better. There's never a cure. There's no way you're going to get better, and we're just going to manage you for the rest of your life. And then people get fed up with that, and then they finally come see me, and they're like, okay, <laughs> what do we do? I'm like, all right, let's make a bunch of changes. So University of Minnesota published this study, too, and they basically said by region, what was the most... Uh, anti-cancer foods for that but although it varies a little bit it's still fruit vegetables nuts seeds berry lagoons green so you can see down here thyroid cancer cruciferous vegetables uh which is like a lot of the stuff they tell you not to do but that's not how that works we we do brominated things chloridated things fluoridated things and then we blame food for causing thyroid problems it's just it's just insane like it's, it's the most frustrating thing sometimes to be the counter information to what most people are told. When we get to diabetes, again, go to the other one if you have diabetes and, and look about eating your way out of diabetes. But diabetes is the same thing, right? Uh, we can cause it, we can uncause it. It's a spectrum, right? Nobody's really type 2 diabetic. They are just creating insulin insensitivity because they are consuming more sugar than their cells want. And then we're testing that and saying, oh, my God, your cells don't want these sugars. We're going to call it a disease. Well, how are you going to change that, <laughs> right? You just change it. So with this, if you look by the years, 1958 to 1990, it's the same thing. We see the same thing all the way to 2008, right? So barely had it. In fact, type 2 is 0 and then all of a sudden we had some and then we created an epidemic but we caused this stuff and then we basically screw people over to where they just uh, cause more and then they uh, just really want to dedicate money for research as opposed to actual reversing of disease so this is where you see these don't you know freaking donut fundraisers for cancer or for diabetes this one at uh, Burger King no no uh, KFC if you drink a large, no, okay, seriously, a mega jug, if you consume a mega jug of pop, they will donate a dollar to help find a cure for diabetes. 
freaking America. This is so insane. So insane. Like, this is the, like, ludicrous. But this is where we're at. And like in our other presentation, we talk about, you know, it, it costs more to be overweight. It costs 4800 So the NIH, National Institute of Health, finally put together a, a cost analysis of how much extra people pay for just being overweight. And um, extra, almost five grand. And if you become type 2 diabetic, it's almost 12 grand. 12 grand extra out of pocket to just be eating a crappy diet. And then we know that one out of two Americans has uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes or are pre-diabetic. And we know that 80% of those that are over, uh, sorry, obese in America, which we hit a record last year, over 50%, we know that 80% uh, of those will be type 2 diabetic within three to five years, which means one out of every two Americans is now pre-diabetic or full-blown full type 2 diabetes. They came up with... Uh, I think it was the Annals of Internal Medicine came up with this uh, six factors. It was five, but basically if you have three of these five, then you're pre-diabetic, right? Low HDL, which is not moving and eat, not eating healthy fats. So eating lots of inflammation and not moving. High triglycerides, which is eating a lot of sugar. High glucose, which is eating a lot of sugar. Hypertension, because you're eating lots of inflammation and not drinking enough water. And obesity, because of all of the above. And lots of inflammation, because of all of the above. If you eat 40 times inflammatory fatty acids that's anti-inflammatory, you should probably have heart disease. So these are all dietary. It's all stuff you can control. Only 1% of disease is genetic. Only 1%, which means 99% of all chronic conditions are self-induced. Things that we have a control over, things that we can actually change. So this is funny because this looks like the COVID uh, easing the curve. But it's actually low glycemic when you eat foods that have lots of fiber or lots of acid. Uh, they actually then bind to the sugars and you have a low surge. So you don't overproduce insulin. You don't over, over absorb, uh, absorb sugar. But the American diet is like this. It's I'm going to eat cereal, which is sugar, milk, which is sugar, the sh added sugars to the cereal. I'm going to eat toast, which is sugar, jam, which is sugar, and drink orange juice, which is sugar. So then it's going to absorb way too fast, and I'm going to overproduce insulin, and I'm going to drop it way too low. And then i got to get blood sugar back up, and then I use epinephrine, growth hormone, cortisol, which then means more anxiety, more depression, and more cancer. And then I say I have reactive hypoglycemia, and then that's not true, really. So then we eat the candy bar, and then it, we keep repeating this process until people get diabetes, or cancer, or both. So it's easy to fix this. This is brown rice. This is white rice. This is whole grain oats. This is instant oats. This is uh, whole potato. This is instant mashed potatoes. It's the American thing. Cheerios, uh, 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 rice poofs, you know. We have to stop doing this. Which is, if you eat fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, berries, legumes, and greens, then your diet is constantly low glycemic, and you don't have to worry about uh, diabetes. And there's a lot of misinformation out there, which is like, well, it seems like it's the right information, but it's not. It might seem logical, but it's not. So we have our low glycemic foods, our medium, and high glycemics, right? So they're based on these numbers, and the different charts will do different numbers. It's not a really good standard for this overall. But you can see the, tr uh, the uh, difference here. So long grain rice versus uh, instant rice. Where's instant rice? I know it's on there. Oh, right there. Rice instant. Yeah. Reverses diabetes, causes diabetes. Reverses weight gain, causes weight gain. What the rest of the world eats, what America eats. We cause these. Now, you'll see watermelon and honey over here. But ain't nobody ever got diabetic from watermelon, okay? So, again, if you're eating this much food that's real, and you have this much that's high glycemic, even as fruits and vegetables, even, nothing's going to happen, right? That's why you can see, you go to other countries where everybody's thin, they're eating crap that you say you can't eat here because you'll gain weight, but why are they so skinny? Well, most everything is fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, berries, legumes, and greens, which is low glycemic, and their little dessert is the rarest thing. Right? So, when you look at this list, you also see all the fruits. Oranges, grapes, 
uh, pears, apples, peaches, plums. Plums are one of the lowest glycemic. So then they blame all the fruit for becoming making people diabetic or fat, but that is only 20% absorbed as blood sugar, 80% becomes prebiotics, right? Um, but if you look over here, this is what people are actually doing. So we eat 150 pounds of added sugar, and then doctors blame the freaking fruit. So it just depends on whether you want to maintain diabetes or you want to reverse diabetes. So your body is always ready to reverse. It's just a matter of unlearning a lot of that process. So when we then say, kind of sum this all up, and we say, okay, go back to the very beginning here. 92% of all heart disease and strokes are preventable, right? Through five very basic lifestyle things. Not meds, not supplements, lifestyle. Then 80% or more of all cancers are preventable. We saw that. That's lifestyle and diet. 60 to 80% of all cancers. And then 100% of type 2 diabetes. Which means we could have one of the healthiest, happiest, longest living, most productive uh, populations possible but we'd rather eat things that look like food, taste like food, smell like food, but are more profitable to a company. Stocks go up, everybody falls apart. So what I want you to gather from this as, as we wrap it up here is really only 1% of disease, disease is genetic. You 99% is what I eat, drink, breathe, rub on my skin, wear, and how I stress. I have the greatest control over that. Only 25% of your genes dictate lifespan which means 75% of how long you live in the in a country where our lifespan is finally decreasing for the first time is what you eat, drink, breathe, rub on your skin, what you wear, and how you stress. We have the greatest control over how long we live, how great we feel, how our family lives, how our community lives, how our church, our faith lives. In a population where everybody's sick, fat, and dumb, and three out of four are chronically managing chronic conditions that they don't have to. We're losing all our money, all our happiness, all our quality of life to manage things that are preventable and reversible through changing how we view our lifestyle. So, if you need help with that, that's why people come to me, right? So, um, you want to really eat your way out of disease, not manage. Eat your way. If you need help, call and make an appointment, right? Our website's nourishpurifyheal.com. And, uh, you know, we can do it during the COVID. We'll do through telemedicine. Uh, so we can do Skype and Facebook video and FaceTime video and all that. But otherwise, you can make an appointment too. But we actually sit down over a period of about six weeks or longer and systematically work with you to go through and change that lifestyle. So the simple solution is only eat real food, only eat to get rid of hunger, grazing rather than making complex meals, eating mostly just fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, berries, legumes, greens, eating organic when you can, eating wild caught when you can, free range, grass fed, grass finished, uh, really e eating meat for flavor, not meat as a meal, drinking half your body weight in ounces of water a day, maximize good, minimize, or maximize good, minimize bad, because you're not going to get perfect. If you, if you really try to focus too much on that, you're just going to go crazy. But uh, it's always process over perfection. Don't worry about perfection. You want process. And that dialectical approach um, is just there's no failure. Right? You're doing your best with what you know. What's the next best thing you can do? And, and that way you have the, you save your hormones through this process too. So, Well, I want to thank you guys for joining me in this little conversation. Feel free to post your questions on YouTube. I'll actually post this through Facebook also. Um, but definitely watch some of our other shows. We have a, about 175 total, I think. So to choose from, some are on YouTube, some are on Facebook, uh, but uh, feel free to leave your feedback uh, and suggestions and stuff too. But otherwise, I thank you. If you need to make an appointment, uh, you can go to drgarrett.tv or nourishpurifyheal.com uh, um, and look forward to helping you. All right. Make sure to share this and like. Bye, guys.